Dear students, in today's class, we are going to talk about virus. And virus are very, very interesting particles because they present to us microbiologists and to other environmental scientists a very interesting question. What is life and what is the absence of life? How do we classify living systems from non-living systems or living beings from non-living beings? What makes them different? For if it is the ability to replicate, then virus are non-living. But put them inside a host and now they can replicate themselves. So now they are living. And thus virus, many uh, microbiologists believe that virus hold the key from when the non-life or the abiotic became biotic and how the life initially evolved. And now the latest theories in viral evolution suggest that it is quite possible that virus existed much before the cellular life came. And it was only when the virus became more complicated, developed more specialized proteins around it, membranes around it, it transformed into protocells or the earlier versions of cells. And this theory has some um, good evidence behind it and as we will briefly talk about in this lecture. But from applied environmental microbiology perspective, viruses are very, very important because well, they are very important because many of our geographical and seasonal diseases which are airborne or waterborne are viral. For example, hepatitis A, hepatitis E are viral waterborne diseases which wreak havoc across the developing countries including India every now and then. And then we have H1N1, swine flu and other airborne viral diseases that again for environmental engineers very important we want to understand the humidity temperature the transportation of air and how long they persist in the airborne particles so all this study comes under environmental engineering they are viral diseases these h1n1 swine flu etc so from um, public health perspective virus is very very important but unfortunately very poorly understood so there is still very um, high impact and rapid research that is being uh, that is being conducted in the field of viral pathogens and uh, transportation of viral pathogens from another point of view viruses are important for us because they interact with our microbes that help us solve our environmental problems for example there are these viruses that are called bacteriophage which are bacterial viruses in sense that they infect bacteria and when they infect bacteria, they can cause their lysis, means they can cause the cell to break away and then they can destroy the bacterial populations. And if they destroy the bacterial populations that are helping us remediate something, for example, in wastewater treatment plant, then we will not have our, the efficiency of wastewater treatment will go down because of the viral infection. So dear students, we are not the only ones who get infected by virus. But even the bacteria, the archaea, they also get viral infections and that affect our environmental processes. Now, um, there are many theories around in the country right now about um, water from certain rivers that are considered to be sacred to have some healing properties or to have anti-bacterial uh, or bactericidal properties. And one of the hypotheses proposed recently is that the water from these sacred rivers have certain bacteriophage in them which kill other bacteria. I, at this stage I want to warn you students that do not um, take all these stories in with pinch of assault. There is no scientific evidence suggesting that. So we are still waiting on it, the jury is not out yet. But we do know that bacteriophage, the virus that infect bacteria and virus that infect us um, play a very important role. And it's, it's, it just happens to be a sheer coincidence that uh, as I'm giving you this lecture about virus, there is a viral flu going on around IT Roorkee campus right now. And just the last weekend, I myself got, I myself got infected by um, a virus. I don't know what it is, but, um, but I'm recovering and I'm here for the lecture. So let's begin. Alrighty, so what is a virus? And as I mentioned earlier, that virus is in the transition zone from the living to non-living. Um, because it cannot replicate uh, or do its activities outside a host. But inside a host, it's an, um, it has a mind of its own. It can hijack the cellular processes. It can cause the cell to um, replicate the viral genome. So uh, talking about life and the absence of life, one of the key parameters of uh, defining something as alive, a living being versus a non-living being is that a living being can replicate 
and a living being can carry out the essential functions for survival. Now these, let, let me write it down. So there are many parameters that are used to define life and I remember in elementary school in my part of the country we would talk about a living being something that can grow, that can make their own food or get food from somewhere and most of them can move but there are exceptions to each of these parameters. It all boils down towards two um, major parameters, ability to replicate and ability to carry out the essential functions to survive. Now if you look at the ability to carry out essential functions to survive, we have talked about this, there are many pathogens that cannot uh, carry out all the essential functions to survive. They need to be present inside a host. In fact, most of our pathogens, the reason that they infect us is because they need um, they need a host to survive and to carry out all essential functions. And not just pathogens, but even the commensal microbes or the symbiotic organisms who are in symbiosis with each other, many of them have um, lost the ability to carry out the functions that they depend upon the other organism. So it doesn't mean that they are not alive, they are alive, but they cannot carry all the essential functions for survival out. So we see that this is again okay, not a foolproof definition of uh, an alive being. If you look at the ability to, to replicate, well, okay, even if these special symbiotic microbes or commensal microbes or pathogens, they uh, cannot carry all the essential functions for survival, then the argument is at least they know how to replicate. So if they can replicate on their own, then it's alive and that's a very good definition and it was a very good definition until the virus came and challenged it. Now virus, they have a situational ability to replicate, depends on their context, depends on their situation. So if they are within the host cell, they have the ability to replicate their genome and thus they are alive. But outside the host cell, they cannot replicate their genome and their particles. And that's why many a times in this lecture, you will notice that I will not call virus just virus, but I'll call them viral particles. And in fact, I'm currently working on some viral particles. And I notice that outside the host, they actually behave like particles most of them are not un, are unable to be metabolically active. So it's very important for you to understand that not only can virus not replicate unless they have a host cell, but their metabolism also goes to zero. So they are inert. So metabolically they are inert outside the cell. So there is no activity going on, they are just a particle. But bring them inside a cell and they are thriving, hijacking the cell, at times hijacking the entire organism. Okay. So we can define virus as subcellular genetic element. Now this is a very interesting term, subcellular genetic element. Subcellular here talks about that it's not that it doesn't it's not a cell. Virus does not have all the essential components of the cell. It might in some cases not have a membrane, it might not have proteins or it might not have RNA or DNA, it might not have some other essential components that are typically present in a bacterial, archaeal or eukaryotic cell, but it does have genetic elements. That is very important and the beauty of virus is that they might have DNA based um, genetic element, they might have RNA based genetic element they are incapable of replicating without a host. So let's look at the viral replication. Here you have viral, viron, so single viral particle and there is this green DNA inside it and this viron will have attachment or adsorption to the cellular membrane. It will inject, this uh, viron will inject its DNA inside and the protein coat, this is the coat of the protein, it is called capsid and the proteins are called capsomeres, we will talk about them. So the viral DNA is injected inside and once it is injected inside it is transcribed and then translated. So transcription means if it is, now remember this we are talking about DNA virus so it is transcribed first. So it, it, uh, mRNA is made from this and then it is converted into protein and then these are the uh, capsomeres, so proteins that will make the capsid, the coat, 
protein code and then next thing we know the cell is full of uh, virons and then these virons will be released out after breaking the cell this is basically viral infection so when you have viral flu viral infection something like this is going on inside your body now because we are eukaryotic organisms viral infection looks slightly different some viruses will only replicate in the cytoplasm some will go and attack our nucleus um, the nuclear um, nucleic acid in a nucleus but in for a prokaryotic cell this is the basic outline the other particle we'll be talking about in this class or if not this one then definitely the next class next lecture are viroids these are extracellular virus particles so they are viral particles but they don't have anything else except rna single stranded rna so here if you note this viron has a, a protein coat which is capsid and it has dna but if it were a viroid, it would only have single stranded RNA, and no protein, no DNA. It's a very interesting um, particle and we'll talk about it. Alrighty, where did virus come from? I briefly mentioned in the introduction that there is a recent hypothesis that virus were the first um, agents able to replicate themselves that evolved or protovirus. So even before the LUCA, even before the last universal common ancestor arrived, we assume that Luca is a cellular ancestor, virus arrived. So, and then there are many theories about how virus arrived, we will talk about them. But the latest theory, and this is this was published in Nature in 2006, a very nice journal. I highly encourage you to go through nature reviews and nature every now and then. Um, so, even before the Luca arrived, we had an ancient virosphere, and basically. Uh, these proteins or in, and this DNA and RNA, the nucleic acids, they started interacting with each other, with themselves, and they started replicating. And from here, we had um, re evolution into bacterial virus and archaeal virus and eukaryotic virus, and these form the modern virus. So this is what we have now, and the ancient virosphere is absent; it is gone. There are some questions that still need to be explained in this theory for example how come some archaeal viruses are very similar to bacterial viruses how did this relationship happen the other question that's very important to understand if there were no host present before the ancient virus were emerged how were the virus replicating and now there are some uh, rational uh, explanation that scientists have given how they could have been doing but and this is a very interesting topic I, I the, in your homework there is a paper that you have to read and you have to answer some questions related to it so I will leave it for your homework but there is some very beautiful research going on in the evolution of virus now this theory this particular approach to viral evolution or even the evolution of life to begin with is a regressive hypothesis another hypothesis is that the cells started before virus started but um, the cells they would lose some of their dna essential dna which would be captured by other cells neighboring cells and then they would replicate it and make more um, stable forms of dna or rna that could survive out in the environment so let us look at how the virus came into picture, there are three th theories that we will talk about. The first one says that which I just mentioned, genetic fragments that were coding for essential cellular functions, they escaped and the viral ge genome was gained and the, these genes inside the cellular host, they formed virus like particles and these were more stable in the external environment. Then there is reductive evolution which is um, primitive cells they kept on undergoing deletion of their nucleic acids because they were uh, either endosymbionts with their host or um, they were in very like they were in some symbiotic relationship they kept on losing their size in their genome until they reduced to viral particles and this is your reductive evolution and then you have missile based evolution this is wonderful evolutionary theory where we believe that the proto earth or the earth in the primitive times you know lot of years ago had lot of missiles and these missiles were the ideal compartments where chemistry could be such that we would have nucleic acids RNA or DNA single stranded or double stranded that could form and then there were enough amino acids for them to make proteins and they these uh, trapped nucleic acids they eventually had the ability to translate into proteins and they formed protovirus. So I have written here primitive atmosphere had missiles which could trap nucleic acids etc. Over time they had ribosome activity and they formed protovirus. So these are the three theories on how the virus evolved. Again as I said this is 
the point of contention for scientific community we are still figuring this out but at the same time because it is we don't know about it it is a very very exciting field for research already so coming back to uh, the evolutionary theories um, if you remember i mentioned that the protein uh, coat of the virus is called capsid uh, we noticed that um, there are um, we can divide the um, life or you know beings micro microbes into two different groups one are the ribosome encoding organisms which encode ribosome which will allow them to translate and make their own proteins so the key feature for virus is that they can't make their own essential proteins albeit there is an exception because some viruses have their own enzymes but most of them they require a host to make a protein so they require a host to get the protein coat and to have um, multiple copies of their own but then the ribosome encoding organisms don't need it so the ribosome encoding organisms are bacteria or can eukarya we know a lot about bacteria thankfully we know pretty much about eukaryotes archaea we are figuring out so we know a lot about ribosome encoding organisms but then there are some organisms that don't encode for ribosome they encode for capsid we don't want to translate anything but you take our genes you take our rna and make a capsid for us make a protein code for us. So these are archaeal viruses, bacterial viruses and eukaryotic viruses. And on the right panel here we have a tree of life for virus. So what I want you to note here is that um, viruses are very diverse, very very diverse. I mean not only in their structure, not only in their shape and in their behavior but also in their genes and the nucleic acids. I have mentioned this casually in this lecture earlier but please note some viruses only have DNA, some viruses have only RNA, most viruses do not have any enzymes or proteins in them. So we have DNA based viruses, RNA based, even among them we have single stranded, double stranded DNA based viruses or single stranded and double stranded RNA based viruses. Despite this immense diversity which is unimaginable in bacterial, archaeal, eukaryotic kingdom, we notice that these viruses they have certain conserved domains. So they exhibit homology, basically they point out towards shared ancestors. So we can actually make trees like this. So we have bacula virus, pox virus, we have archaeal viruses, bacterial viruses, we have herpes virus. So and all these viruses we know that they have homology and we can make such taxonomic um, ancestry trees with them, hinting that perhaps all the viruses started from some protovirus and we do not know yet if the virus came before or the microbe came before but the evidence is gathering in favor that virus came before okay so um, the point key take home message from this right panel is that capsid proteins show homology across both dna and rna viruses okay some of the viruses here are dna some of them are rna viruses but all of them have some homology and also for both um, okay the other thing is mutation rate is inversely proportional to genome size so the smaller the virus is the faster it will mutate and the larger viruses are uh, more stable. Again the DNA based viruses will be more stable, their mutation rate will be lower, the RNA based viruses would mut mutate faster. Similarly single stranded um, viruses will have faster mutation rate, double stranded viruses will have slower mutation rate. This gives us an idea of how the evolution of virus might have happened, perhaps it started from really small genome protoviruses that were RNA based, they eventually evolved to the more stable DNA based viruses, grew their size in genome, grew the size of their genome, moved from single standard viruses to double standard viruses, but uh, the evolution has not obliterated yet the viruses that are single stranded or have smaller genome because high mutation rates might give them evolutionary advantages in unpredictable in new circumstances which is very common. Alrighty. The other way we can classify the viruses is that and we are not talking about the genetic material only is by their morphology, there are basically two kinds of viruses, one is naked virus and the other is enveloped virus. So naked virus just has a protein coat, a capsid, it has nucleus and this is your naked virus, Okay, no other business is going on. In an enveloped virus you have a protein envelope which is inside which you have a capsid much like this one, inside that you have nucleic acid. So if you remember difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the prokaryotes do not have nucleus, eukaryotes have nucleus, similarly naked virus 
um, don't have the envelope but envelope virus have the envelope and this place inside the capsid including the capsid is called nucleocapsid so remove the envelope and you can make it virus okay virus can be both dna and rna as i mentioned already some of the viral genetic material can be arranged in a circular manner but most of them are linear because they're linear doesn't mean that you will actually see a long hair strand in there but because it's even though it's linear they are usually uh, tightly packed and arranged in some convoluted 3d conformation viruses can be classified into dna rna rna dna viruses dna viruses can be both single stranded double stranded similarly rna viruses can be single stranded double stranded some rare viruses have both single stranded would be retroviruses and then they become hepadenoviruses double stranded dna so they can actually these viruses can actually um, switch from RNA to DNA and back. Alrighty, now let's look at viral growth. How do we study virus? So I want to study virus, but here's the thing: they don't grow outside the host cell, right? So for bacteria, I give them food, I plate a bacteria, and the bacteria will eat food and it will grow on its own. But the virus won't do it; it needs a host. So the first step for growing a virus in lab is to grow a line of cells. So for example, if I want to grow he hepatitis A virus in my lab. But if you want to grow a human pathogenic virus such as hepatitis A virus in your lab, then first you have to grow a cell line. So cell line is basically um, a plate on which your human cells are growing. So for uh, hepatitis A, you might have um, the, uh, the liver cells growing. For a flu virus, you might have endothelium cells growing. So once you have a nutrient agar plate and in the top you have your cells that are growing. Okay, this is for pathogenic viruses, right? So your uh, cell would look very strange, your plate would look very strange, auger plate or some media plate upon which your endothelium is growing, your human cells are growing. If you are growing bacteriophage, the viruses that uh, use bacteria as a host, then you need to grow um, bacteria in your plate. So if you remember how bacteria grow on a plate, they make colonies, but now instead of making colonies, you make sure that the entire plate is covered with bacteria. So you don't see colonies, but you just see a film of bacteria. So you put a lot of your uh, inoculum. So when you, so the step one is you take your nutrient. So if you're growing bacteriophage, you take take your nutrient agar plate. You take a mixture of um, top agar, molten top agar, bacterial cells, and diluted phase suspension. So this also has uh, bacteria. It has agar and it has phase. Phase here is virus. Vi now virus that attack bacteria are called bacteriophage or phage. So you have phage here, and then when you pour it in this. Um, the sandwich of you'll get a sandwich of top agar and the nutrient agar at the bottom. After a while of incubation, you will notice that you will have these plaques that will form in your plate. So everywhere else, because the entire media was had was full of bacteria, everywhere else bacteria will grow. But wherever there was a viral particle that could infect bacteria, it will infect the bacteria and the bacteria will die out in that region. So after a while, you will see these holes. So, for example, when we are growing bacteria, we talk about CFUs, colony forming units, right? How many colonies we have formed. But in case of uh, virus, we call it plaque forming uni units, PFU, how many PFUs already. So, this is how you grow virus in lab. And uh, if you remember, we had a um, turbidity measurement with our bacterial growth. Here we have relative viral count, how as virus increases. Um, how viral count increases as it undergoes different stages. So as the time proceeds from here, there will be latent period. This is an eclipse period and at the time of recording, I must say recently there was a solar eclipse in US and it was in the other part of the world. It was a big news there. So similarly, the virus has an eclipse period where we do not see any growth in virus. So you will not see any growth in virus. In fact, you might just see bacteria growing everywhere depending on the bacteria and its growth rate. So what happens in this eclipse period is that the virus has attached to the uh, cell because it, the bacteria is present, it has attached to the cells, it has absorbed to the cellular membrane, it has even injected its DNA inside the cell and um, but it has not made the viron yet, it has not made the viral particles yet. So it is undergoing the transcription if it is DNA virus and translation and waiting for the proteins to assemble and make capsids. It is only when the protein coat is ready, it is only when the envelope is ready, when all the replicas of the genome genetic material of virus is ready that it will assemble and it will lyse the cell, break the cell and you will see a sudden increase in viral particles. So in the latent period you have the early enzymes right, that are um, 
we will go through this uh, very soon, but how that, that are making a port and entry port for viral DNA to go inside the cell. You will have uh, nucleic acid activity, so you will have transcription or translation or both and then you will have protein coats being formed, so your translation work is happening here. In a very short maturation period, you will have assembly of all these proteins that form the virus and the genetic material that forms the virus and lysis of the cell and then the release. So, in, in very, very fast uprising in the number of cells and then it will be constant of done, infection done, go and find a new host. Okay. So, the first step in cellular infection of virus is attachment, adhesion to the cellular membrane. If you remember bacterial viruses, how they are, they are bilayer, so this is lipid bilayer and um, in this particular case, we are, this is lipid bilayer by the way, first layer, second layer. In this, this is outer membrane and this is cytoplasmic membrane. So, you know what kind of bacteria this is and this is your peptidoglycan layer. The first step is that the tail pin, uh, the tail pin comes and sits on the virus and there is an uh, adsorption here and then the tail fibers, they actually get attached to the cell. Then uh, using its certain enzymes, it creates a port in the cell, uh, in the outer membrane and then, uh, so this is the lysozyme which lyses the uh, membrane so that peptidoglycan layer could be broken and all this could be broken and the port be made and then it's in, it injects its entire genome. This is example of T4 virus, now note here, this capsid now has no genome left, it has released all the genome it had. Now once it has released all the genome, so this was the chromosomal material of your prokaryote, your bacteria, your virus came, sat on it, got adsorbed to it. It had some uh, interesting chemistry going on between its tail pins, tail fibers and the outer membrane. Then it had lysozyme activity where uh, using which it made ports in the cellular membrane. It released its virus, here the viral uh, DNA is, is circular and here it is linear, remember mostly it is linear, some of them are circular and then it will typically, it can undergo two pathways, we are talking about one of the pathways here it undergoes the lytic pathway which is where now this will be transcribed and translated and so transcribed, translated and replicated both. So, we will have multiple copies of genome, we will have the capsid proteins, we will have the tail fibers, all these proteins being assembled. So, all this is eclipse stage and then in the maturation stage they have assembled, they have lysed the cell, broken the cell and now they are escaping. Okay. Um, we will come back to the integration pathway in a bit, so I will come back to this slide, but for now let us move on. Okay, so, when you are talking about viruses, I have already talked about it, some of them are RNA viruses and these are the examples, single standard would be MS2, double standard would be Phi6, then some of them are single standard DNA virus, so we have Phi X, 174, we have FT, M13, M13 for example is used widely in lab, all of these are used widely in lab for different experiments, M13, T42, all these are used for cloning also, so, this, so notice here linear, linear, linear and then double standard DNA, so we have double standard DNA here, some of the lambda mu, T3, T7, T2, T4, these all of uh, very, very important microbes of certain microbiological uh, techniques. Okay. Now, we are talking about animal viruses, so these are not bacterial viruses, but these are eukaryotic viruses. When we talk of eukaryotic viruses, we have a more diversity. So, prokaryotes, smaller cells, you know. We have simpler, uh, we have lot of diversity in pro bacterial, bacteriophage, but when you come to animal viruses, it is just immense. So, we have non-enveloped, we have enveloped DNA viruses, we have non-enveloped and enveloped RNA viruses. So, let us go through them, let us look at their structure one by one. So, this is single standard parvovirus, uh, parvovirus also causes a very bad disease in um, young puppies. Then we have a Papova virus which is double standard, slightly bigger in size. Then we have adenovirus, iridovirus, so you see how the morphology changes. In enveloped virus, we have partially double standard DNA, this is hepadenovirus. This is, has a wonderful capacity to switch from RNA to DNA. Then we have the pox virus, so all pox diseases and if you remember smallpox has been eliminated long time ago. So, this is pox virus, uh, double, it has double stranded DNA and then the herpes virus and herpes is a very common disease and it is not necessarily always symptomic and even when it is symptomic, it we just pass it off as a pimple that is coming up. Um, herpes, um, chick, um, sh shingles are uh, one of the kinds of herpes virus, it is double stranded, it has a more complicated structure. Now, let us look at RNA viruses, we have picornavirus, single standard, we have rio virus, double standard, 
we have all, all these are enveloped single stranded RNA viruses, coronavirus, bunia virus, retrovirus very important, we will talk about retrovirus and then paramyxovirus is a very funny virus also. Okay. Now, now let us talk about the different effects that animal viruses may have on the cell to infect and this is where I go back to the previous slide that I said I will come back to. So, if you look here the one pathway for the vi virus is to undergo the lytic cell pathway. So, in lytic cell pathway what it does it is making is multiple copies, multiple copies of its genetic material of its proteins, it is then they are assembling into viron, viral particles inside the cell, they break the cell membrane, they break the outer membrane and they are released. Now, they can go and infect other cells. So, this is the lytic replication pathway. The other is lysogenic pathway. In lysogenic pathway they do not damage the cell like this, they become inherent part of the cell. Okay. The way it works is that this um, genetic material from the virus will actually become will be integrated in the chromosome of the uh, bacteria. So, it gets integrated into DNA, so it is highlighted by the red and as the bacteria replicates the virus will keep replicating. So, see it is quietly replicate and the bacteria will not notice except that its replication energy demand would increase. It requires little more energy now to replicate because it has slightly longer fragment of genetic material to replicate. It is quite possible that at a given time this integrated viral genome will be excised, it will be removed from the chromosome like this and then the cell might kill it or it might be transcribed, replicated and translated and then it will undergo a lytic cycle. So, both are possible first lytic cycle then lysogenic and then lysogenic can also come back to lytic cycle. Okay. Okay, so, let us look at what happens when animal viruses infect the animal cell. Okay, so, now what we are going to look into is what happens when an, uh, a virus infects an animal cell. Now, this is a special kind of virus, this is a virus that actually when it infects the animal cell, it causes tumor. So, there are certain cancers, there are certain tumors that can be viral caused. For example, the human papilloma virus, it is found, it is also cats are a carrier of it too and when they infect a human, they can uh, cause tumors, they can cause cancers. So, these viruses that cause cancer, so they enter a healthy cell and now they can undergo multiple pathways. One of the pathways that it can directly affect the nucleic acids of the cell and cause it to become transformed into tumor cells. So, this is tumor cell. The other pathway is that it can go, it can form multiple copies. So, it can undergo lysis pathway, it can form multiple copies, cause the cell to die and release the virus. Now, these viruses are free to go and infect other cells. The third pathway it can undergo is uh, it will undergo replication, but instead of killing the cell, it will undergo slow release of viral particles. So, this it would not allow the cell to die. So, the cell function is compromised, cell is not happy, cell is weak, but the virus are being released and replicated inside it at a slower rate. The fourth possibility is that the virus enters the cell, but it is not replicating, this is latent infection. So, this is very common with human papilloma virus all of these stages, many a times people have it, but does not cause tumor directly, but after a while it might revert to lytic infection and they start feeling sick, because now their cells are dying. It is also possible that if it is a tumor based virus and it is quite potent, it will transform these viral particles will transform healthy cells into tumor cells, which are um, which suck all the nutrients from the body. The other interesting kind of virus that we want to study in this lecture and I think this is the last kind of virus we are studying in this lecture are retroviruses. So, the beauty of retroviruses is that they have RNA. So, their replication this is a typical retrovirus. So, you notice that uh, there are their surface envelope proteins and then you have the transmembrane proteins, you have RNA, you have these enzymes usually they are reverse transcriptase, integrase or protease. So, reverse transcriptase allow reverse transcription, integrase will allow integration with other um, integration into other genetic material if need be and then you have lipid membrane bilayer, you have a core shell protein here and then you have the core protein here. Okay, how does retrovirus replicate? So, the first step of retrovirus is that it will enter, it will the cell and then there will be uncoating. So, all the coats would be removed and now you have a let us say single stranded RNA. So, the reverse transcriptase will allow the single stranded RNA because remember these are single stranded RNA viruses they will allow them to undergo reverse transcription. So, now they have double stranded DNA. 
Now this double stranded DNA will enter the nucleus, so we are assuming this is infecting nucleus, uh, uh, eukaryotic cells, so animal cells. So it enters the nucleus and then it becomes part of your nucleic material. So remember the integrase they will allow the uh, double stranded DNA that has been see, reverse transcript. Uh, reverse transcribed from the single cell uh, single stranded RNA to become essential part of DNA. So, it is not undergoing the lytic pathway, but the lysogenic pathway. And now here we have pro virus and then this will be transcribed as in this, uh, this part of the genetic material undergoes transcription and now you have viral mRNA and remember this is a single stranded RNA. So, when you have viral mRNA after transcription of genetic material you basically have virus. Now, this virus can be translated, it will make all its proteins, it will be ready, it will make the uh, and then it will get out of the host cytoplasmic cell membrane, it will be released out. Now, it has pro viral progenies. So, dear students I think this is a good place to stop the lecture for today. In next lecture we will talk about viral diseases. We will also briefly go through some other pathogens which are neither bacterial, archaeal, eukaryal or viral like viroids which are slightly different from virus but are immensely um, powerful when it comes to infections in plants and we will briefly talk about primes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.